If you've ever wanted to know the proof of which type of garden bed is best, you're gonna to wanna to tune into today's video. It's Brie here from Blossom and Branch Farm, and if you think you know the best way to start your garden, prepare to be surprised. Now you might recall that back in the fall, we actually did an experiment where we started garden beds three different ways. We did a no-till method, a lasagna bed method, and my own method, which I call the native soil method. No-dig gardening was made popular by a man named Charles Dowding. His theory focuses around minimizing soil disturbance, and his methods include laying a thick layer of cardboard to smother out any existing vegetation or weeds, and then topping with about six inches of compost. The second bed that we tried was the lasagna bed method. Lasagna bed method starts much the same way, usually with a base layer of cardboard to smother out existing weeds or grass. And then on top of that, you layer different materials. So we actually used grass clippings, we used a layer of oat straw that we grew here at the farm, and then you also top that with some topsoil or compost. And then the third way, which is my version, my way, which is probably actually more traditional, is called the native soil method. It's just what I've nicknamed it, and it entails doing a till. So we've built beds this way in existing grass. Now this doesn't work if you have a rhizome based weed or grass because tilling a rhizome based weed is going to create more weeds. So you may have to do something different if you're dealing with rhizome based weeds, but that's another topic. So we start with a till and then we remove the clumps of grass. We add a little tiny bit of compost in and then we did a cover crop. I believe we did a mix of radish, peas and oats and we let that grow a little bit until it was winter killed. Now it didn't get very big. When making these beds, we used the same compost across all three. Now the theories behind the no dig and the lasagna bed method are that you're minimizing soil disturbance because obviously tilling and disturbance of the soil is going to kill a lot of the microbial soil life that's there to help mineralize the nutrients in the soil and make it available for your plants. So the more we kill that soil life, the worse off our plants and our soil are going to be. So the theory behind no dig and lasagna bed is that you're building up on top of that soil. Rather than disturbing the life that's in the soil, you're just building up. Now I guess hypothetically this idea works, but there are a couple inherent problems with it. Number one is that by building up on top of that soil life, you're actually smothering it out. So this can happen when you're using a really thick cover crop. We've learned this as well. If our cover crop grows really thick, it can actually smother out the soil life that's happening underneath. Same thing is happening when we do a no dig or a lasagna bed method. That layer of cardboard and then a thick layer of materials on top is smothering out the existing soil life. It's not used to being buried under that much stuff and it becomes anaerobic. So you're killing it off anyway. So the whole theory behind trying not to disturb the soil life by layering stuff on top doesn't really work as well as we might think. Now the other problem with these two methods is that both of these methods rely on some sort of probably purchased soil or compost. Yes, Charles Dowding makes a lot of his own compost. On my scale, on most home gardeners scale, they aren't able to make enough to keep up with their own garden beds. Now the no dig method tells you to put another inch or two of compost annually on top of your beds. Most of us aren't able to start with six inches and then put another two inches all over all of our beds. We just don't make enough. So most of us rely on purchasing in, either in bags or in bulk, compost. So what's the problem there? Do you know what's in your compost? Most people don't. Most people have no idea what's in their compost. And there are all kinds of different composts. There are composts that are food-based. There's compost that is vegetation-based, but most bulk composts that we're going to be finding out there on the market are animal manure-based. And what's the problem with animal manure? Salt, nitrates, phosphorus, those things are really high in bagged and bulk compost. And it's next to impossible to find out what's really in your compost, especially if you're buying it in bulk. You should be able to request a test if you're buying in bulk. You should be able to request the data sheet from your compost provider. We just found that from load to load, the level just varies. And overall, the salt and nitrate and sulfate levels are all very high in those purchased bulk composts. The other problem with bulk compost is that often they contain biosolids. And what's wrong with biosolids being in our compost? Well, biosolids are human waste and human waste contains a lot of heavy metals and PFAS or forever chemicals other things that we don't want our compost. We are a permaculture based no-till farm for ongoing maintenance. But for new beds, I till to establish because I would rather use and fix the soil that I have on site than bring in soil that I know nothing about. So what we did was we used the Haney test and the Haney test is basically 
a more modernized version of a soils test. It's kind of the gold standard for what's out there for soils testing right now. Soils testing, if you just send in your soils test to your basic extension service, they're going to do a very generic soils test and that soils test hasn't really changed much in 60 years, even though we've learned a lot about soil in that time. What we've learned in that time is that there is so much more life within the soil than we ever thought. There's a lot of life and activity going on in that soil and that plays a huge role in the health of the soil. It's not just NPK, it's not just micronutrients and calcium, it's not just those numbers, it's what is the microbial life in your soil. So the Haney Soils Test, actually what they do is they take your soil sample, they dry it out, and then they wet it. So what they're doing is they're simulating rain. There's nitrogen in rain, right? People always say this, your garden greens up after a rain because of the nitrogen in rain. Eh, not really. There's a little bit of nitrogen in rain, but it's not really enough to change your plants that much. What actually happens when there's a big rainfall is there is a flush of microbial activity. All of the microbes in that soil get charged up. When it's wet, they start to function and move faster. So you see a big flush of growth. So that's what the Haney test is actually replicating. How much is the life in your soil active? It's also measuring things like existing nitrogen. So the nitrogen that's available within your soil for release by the soil microbial life, not just what's sitting there, but the potential, the reserve, that's being measured by the Haney Soils Test. And I will put a podcast link below for the Regenerative Agriculture podcast if you really wanna learn more about Rick Haney and his soils test because it's very interesting. But that's the soils test that we did to compare these three garden beds. So we did it through Ward Labs and I'm gonna share, I'm not gonna share all of the numbers, but I am going to share the important ones. All right, so we're gonna compare these numbers. So we're gonna start with one called respiration. And as we mentioned, that Haney Soils Test is kind of measuring the soil life, the ability for the soil to respirate. This is very important to your plant health. So the higher the number, the better. So in order of performance, the best performer in terms of microbial life and respiration was the native soil method with 270.9. Number two was the lasagna bed method with 251.0. And number three was the no-dig bed with 120.2, less than half of the respiration rate of the native soil method. It's showing that there is some soil life happening in each of those, but by far the bed with the highest amount of respiration and microbial life was the native soil method. Next up, we have soluble salt. And this is huge because if your soil is salty, your plants are going to turn yellow and die. Salts are one of the biggest problem that I see in soils in raised beds, because usually raised beds were buying in a lot of soil. Purchased soil tends to have a lot of salt in it, especially if it's using animal manure. So coming in at the lowest amount of soluble salts, we have the native soil method at 0.86. Coming in next highest, we have the no dig at 3.74 and the lasagna bed method had a shocking 5.34 soluble salts. Very high, very poor for plant growth. Let's look at organic matter. Now this one didn't surprise me as much. Now the more organic matter, the better. And that's because organic matter breaks down into usable nitrogen by your plants. But having too much organic matter can create a bit of a nitrogen tie up. So you also don't want it to be too high. Now for the native soil method, we had an 8.2% organic matter. For the no dig bed, we had 11.3%. And for the lasagna bed, it was the highest at 13.5%. This doesn't surprise me because lasagna bed had a lot of organic matter in it. It had the grass clippings, it had the oat straw in there. So the fact that that has organic matter that's higher than the other two makes sense. Now, this also leads to the next number, which is organic nitrogen release. This is a really cool thing that the Haney test measures that normal soils tests don't. So normal soils tests don't measure nitrogen because it's too volatile in the soil. It can fluctuate quite a bit week to week. The Haney test is measuring what's available to the plants down the road in terms of nitrogen. So that organic matter number ties into the nitrogen availability number. So this makes sense. So organic nitrogen that's available for release in the native soil is 50.1. In the no dig method, it's 58.5. And in the lasagna bed method, it's 94.1. So this is where the lasagna bed method looks good, is that it creates a lot of available nitrogen for release down the road. Now that does take time to break down, but all that organic matter in the lasagna bed that's where it's coming into play, is where we're seeing it in the nitrogen that's available down the road. And sometimes having too much nitrogen in your soil can actually be detrimental, especially if you're trying to grow ornamentals like flowers or dahlias. 
too much nitrogen can be a bad thing. Finally, we're gonna talk about phosphorus because phosphorus is one of those things I talked about this week on Instagram. There are videos out there right now that drive me nuts about adding bone meal to every tomato plant. Do not do that. Most of our soil has more than enough phosphorus. Studies are showing that home gardens have way more phosphorus than is needed. In fact, it has more than most agricultural fields and home gardens and lawns are actually what's contributing to a lot of phosphorus runoff, leading to algae blooms and eutrophication, the death of aquatic life. You don't have to use bone meal in every planting hole. It is way overkill. Phosphorus in our soil most of the time is sufficient for growing veggies. So for our native soil method, we had a number of 232, which is telling me that our native soil already has sufficient phosphorus. I don't need to add phosphorus. Get ready for these two numbers. The no-dig method, 568, and lasagna, 651. Almost three times the amount of the phosphorus in the native soil method. This is way too much phosphorus. When you combine that level of phosphorus with the alkaline soil that we have here on the front range, most of our soils are in a 7.5 pH, that's gonna give us things like zinc deficiencies and iron deficiencies in our plants. Too much phosphorus not only is bad for runoff and aquatic life, it's also bad for your plants. This is why I say get a soils test, even if it's just once, so that you know what you don't have to add, what you don't have to waste your money on. It is worth the $50 to get this information. All right, so now that I've ranted, <laughs> let's summarize this information. All in all, the no dig and the lasagna bed had lower overall respiration, which means that it had lower active soil life. This makes sense to me. Now, even though it's been six months, there has been time for stuff to work its way through those layers of cardboard and, and compost and work its way up through the soil. That soil life is still less healthy in the no-till and the lasagna beds than it is in the native soil bed. So even though we tilled that bed, that soil life was able to bounce back much quicker than when we smothered it and suffocated it with layers of compost and cardboard. The other note is that the no dig and the lasagna bed had incredibly high levels of sulfates, soluble salts, and phosphorus. So again, this has a lot to do, because we're relying so much on compost in these methods or, or purchase soil, it is very hard to know what is in that soil. This is why I would always prefer to amend what soil you have on site, even if it's the crappiest, rockiest, sandiest soil, you can fix a lot with cover crops, guys, a lot, and a little bit of compost not six inches of compost. It's just way overkill. There's just too much variability in, in compost, in purchased soil, in purchased bulk compost or bag compost. And this is what we're seeing when we're looking at these numbers. That's why we're seeing these salt levels and these phosphorus levels. It's because these bulk composts are largely animal manure based because that's a cheap way to make compost. And this was even the highest quality compost that I could find here in the front range. I didn't go for the cheap stuff. Um, I don't buy cheap compost here. But I have learned through seeing my soils test over time that every time I add compost, my phosphorus level and my salt level goes through the roof. I just really don't add it anymore. I wanted to do the soils test to be sure that I wasn't having confirmation bias on this. But I am going to say, let's stop pushing this no dig idea of buying in so much compost and so much topsoil and so much stuff to add to your soil and focus on using the soil that we have and amending that through cover cropping because there is so much potential in our existing soil and what we're doing is we're bringing in stuff with a lot of heavy metals, potential PFAS contamination, salt, phosphorus, sulfate. We're dumping that on top of our soil and cardboard, which has who knows what in it. There's just not a lot of information out there about what's in cardboard either. So why are we pushing that as, as such a better alternative to tilling and using what we have? Don't till your garden every year. We till it once to establish the bed and then once it's tilled and workable, then we leave it alone. You don't have to till it ever again if you don't want to. But to start with what you have, it's not only cheaper, it's much less risky, okay? There's much less risk that you're going to be putting lots of salts and sulfates and nitrates and phosphorus into your soil and heavy metals and PFAS. So that's the summary. We're still gonna plant into all three of these beds. So the next step is we're gonna put, uh, we're gonna put the same plants in each bed that were grown the same way here at the farm. We are going to do a side-by-side -side comparison and we're gonna put it to the test and see which one does the best and which one does the worst. 
All right, guys, I hope this video was helpful. Uh, please give me your insights below. I'd be really interested to hear what you have to say. Please like and subscribe. It really helps us out a lot here at the farm if you do that. And we hope to see you back here soon at the farm.